All right, well, welcome everybody. We're super happy to have you to talk about really one of our favorite topics. Yesterday, I think we tried to set up the framework of how to understand just kind of faith transitions from a social science perspective so that we can understand that we're not unique. Um, in some ways, we are unique in other ways, right? Because each tradition is unique in their own way. Um, and that's kind of setting you up so that you can kind of like feel the lay of the land from a bit of an objective stance. It's a little hard to be objective when you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> um, and so now we hope that that framework sets you up for us to talk about relationships. Uh, because at some level, um, what what a faith transition is, it's not just a personal belief system, it's a community, it's what your marriage sometimes is many times based on, it's um, a structure where you've raised maybe your children or are in the process of raising your children, and so all of this has to do with relationships. So I think a lot of people that come to these things imagine that we're going to talk a lot about the church, and as you notice, <laughs> we're talking a lot less about the church as we are talking about kind of human dynamics and, and relationships. So a huge part is of what we really see as a solution to so much of your woes and your sadnesses and your uh, concerns is this idea about um, knowing how to foster emotional intimacy. And again, this doesn't necessarily seem to be a Mormon problem, right? So we have issues with intimacy um, really nationwide, culture-wide, uh, for a lot of reasons that we'll, we'll get into today. So that's kind of where we're starting out. You want to head to the next slide? Yeah, and the, and the only thing that maybe I would add is that, um, <clears throat> not to, again, this isn't about the church, but it... It is really profound for me to consider this idea that um, we have spent, as Mormons, thousands of hours in instruction from primary to Sunday school, seminary, institute, elders quorum, relief society, priesthood, all that stuff, BYU, you know, religious classes. And there's pretty much never been a single lesson on emotional intimacy that we ever received, or at least I didn't. I know there's a there's probably like a celestial marriage course at BYU or something, which I've taken, and I've also taught the LD, the marriage class, you know, in my wards before. And I would say they do not focus necessarily on what we're going to be focusing on today. And what's bizarre about that is I think this is probably the single most important topic we could ever talk about because it permeates as Natasha just said it's not it, it, it starts with your own self-awareness and health which is kind of what we tried to talk about yesterday but it, it's your partner it's your kids it's your parents it's your siblings it's your community it's your best friends it's everything and we've never talked about it and it's not again it's not just a Mormon problem but it's it's a, it's a global problem and I just don't understand why the most important things are completely ignored. I don't understand that. So that's why we, that's why we did this, and that's why we're, that's why we believe so much in this. Uh, this is the single most top important topic. I I feel like I talk about. I would agree with that because it sets up the foundation for everything else we'll talk about, like parenting and sexuality and um, identity concerns and all of those things. You can't really do any of those things well without a good foundation of understanding what intimacy is about. And it's also essential for the communicating with believing family and friends conversation that we're going to have later too. Because right. if you don't understand healthy relationships, then you don't know how to navigate these extended relationships. So. Really in the church, we've been taught uh, mostly through a missionary kind of um, lens, how to teach people and how to talk to people and how to try to convince people that we have the right way. And that's actually probably the most antithetic you can, thing you can do for intimacy <laughs> as far as uh, trying to connect with people, is trying to change people. Most of us don't want to be changed. Most of us, I mean, if you have a two-year-old or if you've raised, you know, at any point in your life a two-year-old, you start understanding pretty quickly that people are fairly independent. That's what's the first word that a kid learns that they're really excited about. No. <laughs> so they want their own way, right? They want their own kind of um, independence. And, um, and again, what's so fascinating to me and the irony of it all is that Mormon doctrine has a lot of 
ideas around personal agency and the importance of honoring that. And, uh, and yet, as a culture, we do a poor job of that. So. Yeah, the whole war in heaven was about not, n- n- no. not no compulsion, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <laughs> not being forced, about free agency, free will. Yes. And we struggle with that as a culture. The other thing I'll just mention from a research perspective, so there's been a lot of interesting uh, research recently coming out, I would say in the last five years, in regards to substance dependence, addiction is what most of us call that. And um, so they do a lot of this research with, you know, nice little rats. And uh, so what they have found out, which is really interesting, is that if you have a rat in a maze, you know, with like the cocaine drip or the meth drip or whatever, they find that pretty pretty fast and they figure out ways to get to that pretty fast and they become you know dependent on those substances to feel good what's been really super fascinating is that they have made a rat community with lots of fun things for the rats to do and lots of relational aspects for the rats to be a part of with a cocaine drip and they don't become addicted they actually choose not to go towards the cocaine when they have lots of other aspects to bring pleasure in their lives. So I think that really fits into this category of rat intimacy. <laughs> They're having a lot of intimacy with themselves and other, in- and other rats. And so they are able to avoid some of the self-medicating things that we talked about yesterday that can be so harmful. So it's really kind of changing some of the ideas about, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, substance dependence is all about the biology and getting addicted to something, we're we're realizing it's much more relational. It's much more relational. People choose medication and drugs because they are completely alone and isolated and unresilient and have been through many difficult things. So um, anyway, that's just an interesting (laughs) little tidbit. Yeah. And I think if you look at what what I perceive to be the statistics of Utah in terms of Pornography use, pornography addiction, uh, prescription drug abuse, and those sorts of things. Somehow Utah's really high. and Even opiate um, addiction is yeah. high in Utah. So. Yep. And uh, I, I just have to think that if we as a culture could get better at emotional intimacy, um, and not just in the marital level, but in the community level, understanding how to, how to f- uh, get our needs met through healthy relationships, we wouldn't have such epidemics in, in these areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do we mean by emotional intimacy, right? I mean, these are kind of these, these catch words, they sound really nice, but how do you start defining it? How do you start breaking it down so that we can actually attain it? Why is it so hard to obtain if it's something that we can all benefit from and that we can actually probably want? Why do so many of us resist it or act in ways that don't allow us to have it? Um, So that's a lot of what our presentation is going to be on today to help you understand. Again, it's not because we're stupid or self-harming or any of that. There's like real reasons why these things come um, hard to attain. And most of that has to do with self-protection. So again, most of the things that I find really interesting about humans is that there's always a tension between two kind of either values, needs, desires. Um, And so the need for self-protection kind of goes against um, the things that are required for for, for intimacy, like vulnerability, for example. So if I have to be vulnerable, I have to take a risk, right? And so I don't know if I want to do that because I want to self-protect. So those tensions are constantly at work. And that's what a lot of this presentation will be about, is helping you understand what's getting in the way. So what do we think of, how, how, we talked about this yesterday, how has, more, how has our collective Mormon experience kind of corrupted the use of the term intimacy? What? Sex, right? And uh, w- why don't we just say sex in a Mormon context? <laughs> because it's, it's a taboo, dirty it's word. a dirty word. So we've co-opted actually the less dirty thing that's actually the most essential thing. And we've now, you know, made it synonymous with sex such that we forget the importance of the core thing, which is the emotional intimacy. And now we've associated it with something that we perceive to be dirty. It's messed up on a lot of levels, right? But, but 
it, it, it is true that because we're afraid to say the word sex in a church context, instead we say the word uh, intimacy. But it's important to understand that when we talk about emotional intimacy, we're not talking about sex, although it's a prerequisite for uh, a lot of the healthy type of sex that you probably are interested in. There, there is sex without intimacy, of course. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like about to jump in. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I think that these are things that, again, from a values perspective, you may value intimacy as part of a sex life, but there are actually many ways to have healthy sex without intimacy, and that is something that we do not necessarily make room for in our culture at all. And so, um, so it is really important to separate those two things out because you want to know what type of sex you're interested in and whether or not you want intimacy to be part of that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I would just say we need to be careful to not just assume that sex and intimacy have to go together in order for it to be healthy. And you can actually have a lot of intimacy in a relationship and still have not so great sex. Or no sex. Um, yeah, so intimacy is not sex. It's not the same thing as a committed relationship, and you know that because how many of you know about committed relationships that really aren't having a lot of sex, right? And it's not romance. You can have sex without romance. You can have romance without sex. So these are all separate things that we tend to get confused about. Right. The best definition that, that I've come across that's kind of most memorable, that, that really is effective for intimacy is sort of this play on words, into me seeing. It's, it's having your partner see the full and the real you inside. So that's kind of simple. And I think, you know, I, I only discovered this just a few years ago. I'm like, wow, that's really good. It's being seen fully or as fully as possible by your partner. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll just get into this now. I can revisit it later. But um, especially, you know, in, in Mormon culture, we really do not necessarily um, propel or role model true intimacy. What we are much more, um, which, what we're much better at projecting is what I call protective intimacy, which is fake intimacy. And what I mean by that is that we are set up, especially in like Mormon men typically have messages about don't hurt your wife, right? She's fragile, she's beautiful, she's special, she's sacred. So don't bring your whatever um, into a space where that may harm her. In the sexual sphere, this is a huge problem, right? Because if you have fantasies or libidos or tastes or differences that you want to explore with your wife, well, now that's set up in a way where you may hurt her. And so what happens oftentimes is that goes underground and secret. So Mormon men in my practice typically show up in ways that they have very little skills in knowing how to advocate for their own kind of desires and needs and wants, especially in the sexual field. Okay. Women also are given a lot of messages about protection and being caregivers and being you know, people who are going to really help the community and help their families. And many of you spoke about these themes in the last few days where again, your needs are not necessarily primary, the needs of the system and of your children and of your husband are primary, so how are you supposed to even show up to be seen when you can't even express who you are to begin with? Many of you already said, I don't even know who I am. So how can I see you if you don't even know who you are? So you can see how the messages that we've had that I think are well-intentioned about protecting each other are actually not at all about intimacy. So we conflate kindness with intimacy. And actually, intimacy is not so much about being kind. It's about being real. And I don't know that we know how to be real. Yeah. And if I think about, you know, men are supposed to be these righteous, strong priesthood holders and providers. Um, they're supposed to serve in their callings and be really busy at church if they're not at work. Women are nurtured from from adolescence or even childhood to be the gatekeepers of purity or of chastity. So they're almost in this motherly role of the relationship before the relationship gets going, gets going. So the woman's making sure the husband's not, you know, looking at porn. The woman's making sure that everything stays righteous and pure. Um, and, and uh, it's so easy to drop into the role of parenting 
and just worrying about life that uh, a couple really never ends up forming an emotional bond in a marriage. And that's, that's kind of what this slide is about. This is kind of my best attempt at characterizing an average of kind of how many of our lives unfold. Um, and you guys just, if you'll do like a little checkbox, how many of these bullets kind of apply to you? I know it's hard to read, but I'll read them out. So, so the first bullet is that you, you probably didn't have good intimacy role models in your parents. Yeah, our parents lot, weren't taught any of this stuff either. <laughs> our parents grew up, a lot of our parents grew up, you know, post-World War II, baby boomer kind of thing. You know, there, there were ideas about patriarchy and what meant the role of men and role of women and uh, trying to prosper. And so, uh, and then you add on that the church layer. Uh, a lot of us didn't have the best role models as parents for intimacy. Any, how many of you would endorse that? Okay. Um, the second is that, that we learned that love was conditional. And I don't think that's like intentional. In fact, I don't think, well, there are a few prominent church leaders who would say that love is conditional. But on overall, I, I think if you asked most church leaders, they would say love is unconditional. But the way that we talk about the atonement and repentance and obedience the, the way that oftentimes relationships get lived out in, in a Mormon context is you do good, you get the little reward. You know, you get the little badges for your, you know, your Articles of Faith banner or you get your medallion or you get your eagle. You do, you know, you go to church, you do what's right, you get the pats on the back and the public acknowledgments and you bear your testimony and your parents are super proud of you. And it's this sort of like do the right thing, get the reward. And even if it's unintentional or subconscious, we learn that love is conditional. It's earned. It's, it's earned. It's something that you have to, again, be worthy for. And we have a lot of language around worthiness in the Mormon culture that is quite problematic when it comes to how we understand ourselves and what we think we deserve and how we then negotiate our relationships. And so we're always hustling for love and we're hustling for worthiness and it, it, it is not conducive to good emotional intimacy. It undermines intimacy, and we'll get to that. Um, you oftentimes learn to do the right thing out of fear and control, and healthy emotional intimacy is anathema to fear and control. You, you don't, and we'll talk about why you need safety, but if you are always fearing and being controlled, you don't feel safe. When you think about the classic fear response, what do you think of? You think of closing up, right? You think of your shoulders tensing. Well, that's happening to your vagina and your penis, and that's happening to your brain. So try to have intimacy. And even more important, <laughs> it's, it's happening to your... Um, it's not, and, and this isn't about sex necessarily. Like It's happening to your emotional safety. Mm -hmm. so, so we throw up walls to protect ourselves from being hurt emotionally. And so that closing up, most importantly, happens around our vulnerability and our identity and our feeling of a desire or not desire to be fully honest and open. And that's, that, that's the real killer that then leads Everything to... Everything that's physical is a symbol of what's happening emotionally, right? So I, I bring up that, that yeah, yeah. imagery to help you understand what he's just saying. Yes. Totally. So... Because we're always worried that we're not worthy, and by the way, we learn this in adolescence, if we accidentally masturbate or if we accidentally stumble on porn and, and the hammer comes down, there was a beautiful story told to me yesterday, uh, and I won't, I won't say who, uh, because I don't have permission, but about a, a, a mother who found out that their child was looking at porn and she literally picked up the monitor from the computer and threw it in the trash, right? And... And, you know, just imagine, and not to, you know, and, and we all, you know, we all believe in the Maya Angelou thing about when you know better, you do better. But think about what that's like to a kid that, that sees that type of reaction. It's just like, oh my gosh, I need to be, I can't upset my mom or my dad anymore. I can't uh, do, what, do anything that's wrong. And that carries into adulthood where in the marriage, sometimes you can just always be on alert to not do what's wrong. But also you don't want to violate the Lord's commandments in addition to hurt your partner. And so um, it's just a lot of tensing up in all the physical and emotional ways. Well, and the research on fear-driven um, kind of outcomes is that they only last short term. So I don't know how many of you remember the drunk driving campaign where they would bring in the cars to the high schools, right, and show us 
the horrible car and that would work for about that works for about two weeks and then it doesn't work anymore so people are not motivated by fear long term and actually a lot of the parenting research that's coming out you've probably seen some of the parenting research on punishment and especially spanking and things like that that those are actually um, not helping the child curtail behavior or if they do curtail behavior it's from this kind of secondary um, fear response and so then you're causing trauma and you're causing not really the kind of safety that people need to um, be more value driven instead of fear driven which is a lot of what we talked about yesterday was value driven so how many of you feel like you had a conditional love model growing up okay how many of you um, feel like you uh, had a lot of fear and control growing up okay we're getting for, for the viewing audience we're getting lots of hands going up um, how many of you were in a home where you kind of didn't talk about the hard stuff in fact you might talk about everything but the hard stuff right elephants in all the rooms you just don't talk about them and then yeah so um, so and then we get married super fast right without actually really getting to know our partner it's like the the guy gets off the mission. Is she cute? Does she have a heartbeat? Is she <laughs> temple worthy? Am, am I feeling excited about the prospects of our courtship? Let's get married, right? <laughs> and it's within four months, you know, or six months, right? Um, lots of lots of heads nodding. We get married super young and super fast. And I tell me if I'm wrong that Margie tells me there are good data that show that people who wait to get married oftentimes have more satisfying marriages. Yes, the data really is super bad for us. So <laughs> the data shows that you do much better in marriage if you wait until your late 20s. Um, it shows that it, you do much better if you have an education, both of you. And it, it shows that you do a lot better if you don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Jessica's like, I'm screwed. I'm so screwed. <laughs> although we lo- <laughs> well, she's just she's going home. Jessica's going home. So although we love our children and most of us want to have children, this whole idea that children make us happy is the biggest lie we've ever been now, fed, right? <laughs> so. During the marriage, isn't it true that after the kids move out, happiness can go go quite it high. It can. It yeah. can. It's also a time when... That's true. <laughs> <laughs> says the old couple. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a time when many couples, you know, kind of realize that they've allowed their marriage to not be the, a primary force. And so then when the children leave, that's oftentimes um, another... We see another up in divorce at that point. Yeah, that's true. So we get married super young, super fast. How many of you got married super young, super fast? Okay. <laughs> and then... Um, and then this is where it gets even more problematic because it's almost like it's not a, in some ways it's not a twosome, it's a threesome. In other words, the church is the third partner in the marriage. You're, you're not just married to each other, but it's almost like the church is between you. Well, and there's symbol, I mean, yeah, you're saying the triangle. We were, I remember the triangle. the triangle being taught, right? So it's the husband, the wife, and God. And as long as you're both focused on God, then you're going to be fine. And what's hard is in Mormonism, God means the priesthood leaders because the priesthood leaders speak for God. So it means the church and the priesthood leaders, yes. even if they say God. And so all of a sudden, there's this third party in the marriage that can impact connection, that can impact closeness, that's like always monitoring, giving feedback, even if it's unconscious or you know uh, indirect. Are we doing this right? Are we doing that right? Are we doing all that we should be doing? You shouldn't be doing that. Why are you doing that? You're not living up to my standards. You're not reading the scriptures like you should. You're not praying like you should. Oh, you're looking at porn. You, I caught you masturbating. Like, whatever it is, like, it's, it's just more that can kind of tense us up and, and, and um, set, us, set us up a little bit. So, um, and then immediately we're, we're taught to have kids. So the kids start coming. And, and once you kind of get on that train, kind of that Mormon train, it's like, okay, I've got a man's got to have the successful career, We've got to have lots of kids, got to serve in our callings. 20 years can go by, just boom, 20 years go by. And uh, again, never once did we ever have a lesson to kind of become literate about emotional intimacy. We're just on that train. And as long as you're so busy in parenting or in your job or serving in the church, you don't have time for anything else. And you almost don't even need emotional intimacy 
Because as long as you're so busy doing everything the church needs you to do, like, you know, you're full. At least you're full in terms of your time commitment. <laughs> where, are you, where are you not full, <laughs> necessarily? It takes 18 months to get past the original limerence <clears throat> phase that many, if you've experienced that, it's the falling in love phase where you're kind of like goo goo gaga, you can't see anything wrong with your partner, um, you can't think about anything else, you're super you know, in love, and not everybody experiences that prior to marriage, but many of us do in this kind of romantic culture that we're in. And so um, it takes 18 months to just kind of have that wane down so that then you can become a little bit more rational about your decisions. And uh, so if you think about a typical scenario that comes through my office a lot. If you're married within four months of knowing each other and pregnant within two months of your marriage, I can guarantee you as a husband that you never understood or knew your wife to begin with. Because pregnancy changes us in ways that are (laughs) non-reversible. Excuse me. And it takes two and a half years uh, to hormonally and physically recover from a pregnancy. Um, and, and that's after the baby's born. And so if you have a child every two years, which is what a lot of you have done for you know, the next 15 years, I can guarantee you that you don't know who your wife is. Your wife may not know who she is either, but you don't know who your wife is. And so your entire marriage is based on uh, a reality that, just, that then implodes in my office with women at age 40 to 50 um, in what I call feminist rage and like identity rage and all of these things that they are understanding that something happened to them physiologically and biologically and maritally that completely uh, robbed them of their own self-identity. So try to have intimacy in that perspective. So just to kind of switch to some processing now, um, who would be willing to be vulnerable and kind of say in their experience which parts of this they're, they're, they relate to or they're feeling particularly. And let's get the mics going, let's get the mics turned on. And, and before uh, we even do that, I just wanna say that looking at all of you right now, like <laughs> my anxiety is rising because I can see your facial expressions <laughs> about like, oh my gosh. So I'm very glad that we're processing. <laughs> Yeah, so let's just let's swim in this for a little bit. Get, get some get some catharsis going. So uh, I grew up in a very large Mormon family. I have ten siblings. Um, as much sex as well, I, I can tell you that my parents didn't have a lot of sex in their marriage um, because my How do you mom. Know? How, uh, well, they had, it, they had it ten times, and probably about ten times. It, uh, you know, in talking to my dad later on, because my parents ended up divorcing, oh. um, after all, of our, all the kids uh, got out of the house, um, there wasn't a lot of emotional intimacy that, that went on, um, uh, because my mom kind of was a very strong, uh, and, and in many ways, domineering um, uh parent and and spouse so there wasn't a lot of that emotional intimacy um as children didn't get taught about sex or if they or or my parents way of talking about sex was um kind of church related and um kind of they they i guess they taught my oldest brother who kind of passed things down as as we kind of got a little bit older but that was never something that was Discussed or talked about, um, you know. We. Uh, what about we, emotional intimacy? Uh, did that did that even come up um, between my parents or anytime? Any, anytime ever? Um, In any way? I mean, we, we were. My mom would say that she loved us, but um, things were very um, fear driven. Um, we were spanked as children, um, and. Uh, you know, there was a lot of a lot of conditional things um, or, or terminology that was used. Um, we didn't talk about the hard stuff. Um, I grew up in a house where my mother never admitted if she was wrong, and um, in, in fact, even now, like um, sometimes my brothers and I will will, will try to have little competitions and, and see if I can get my mom to say that she's wrong or admit that she's wrong about, about something. 
Um, so it, it, like, it, that's the, the type of um, house that I grew up in. Um, fortunately for my wife and I, um, we did have, before we ended up getting married, we did have um, a period of time where um, we um, had a relationship with each other uh, we knew each other in high school and, and um, didn't get married until um, after we'd both served missions. And uh, we had actually, before we served missions, we had actually done a few years of college. Um, but in our, in our early part of our relationship, we didn't have true emotional intimacy. Um, and I think a lot of that was because the church... Again, we, we, that was something that was never taught to us, um, both in our own homes, but also not at church. Um, and I think um, there's a lot that, getting back to the fear, um, you know, if, if we had some sort of uh, desire or, or sexual fantasy or anything, um, that it falls outside of what the church prescribes as normal, um, you know, there's a lot of fear of what's my spouse going to think of me, you know, e- e- even if it's, if it's something that's really simple, you know, there's always that fear of, is she going to think that I'm looking at pornography? Um, and, and we had many discussions later on when, when uh, we started becoming more emotional intimate of her admitting that... Um, that she would often worry about me looking at porn if I were to bring up something, like if I um, expressed a desire for sex a little too often, whatever, you know, how, whatever interval that she determined was um, what, what, what it was supposed to be, you know, she had that fear that I was looking at pornography or, or uh, doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, and so you know, that fear of really letting her see me for who I am or who I was, um, was dangerous because of the fear of judgment. And, um, you know, so that's definitely things that we, we've had to work through. Can I, can I just share one quick reaction? Jacob, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I've, I've been in my mind, I've been thinking, okay, we're, this is about emotional intimacy, intimacy. This is not a presentation about sex. We're trying to actually make it clear that there's a difference between emotional intimacy and sex. Yet we keep coming back to talking about sex. And I, I mentioned that to Natasha. And then I just realized that the level of obsession and shame and fear we have around sex is one of the primary culprits for killing our emotional intimacy. Because, and, and I kind of alluded to this earlier but because if you step out of line sexually you're 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 beaten down in such a significant way you're shamed you feel so awful that it makes you so scared and protective that you don't want to show who you really are you learn to lie or cover up or hide because of that and so they it's really hard to i don't think we can really separate it out so thank you for for helping us see that better they're intricated in the sense of it affects emotional intimacy. Whatever, whatever it is that you are feeling, there's potential judgment. I'm not going to be accepted. If I really show my cards, will somebody reject me? Will somebody not want me anymore? Am I going to be undesirable? And um, so it can be a, a myriad of topics that lead you to feel that way. And yet our current obsession around the narrative of sexuality in our culture, it it just kind of sets it up that no matter who you are, you're going to fail. You're going to fail at the ideal of the sexual narrative in our church. And so I don't know how any of us, men, women, straight, gay, transgender, are going to escape the reality that emotional intimacy will be affected by our sexual scripts and narratives. And why, you know, in my profession, when people say, well, what do you, what do you focus on? And they want me to choose either faith or sex. And I'm like, nope. It's both. <laughs> I have to do both. Who else? Um, Camille. Second time on camera with bike clothes on. Uh, get a Camille shower a great, at the break. Isn't Camille a great singer, by the way? Yeah. 
<laughs> Not quite a Dina Menzel, but um, so I I was going through all the bullet points. I can check every single one, and it's easy to you know direct the lens on my parents and you know everything that's wrong with me is always your parents' fault. But I actually have had enough training now to know to turn the, the it's a lot more powerful to turn the lens on me, and. Um, Oh, uh, you know, what of this am, am I? I am not modeling healthy intimacy to my children at all. You're not. Um, I am not. No, I. Um, one example: uh, intimacy with my 19-year-old daughter, who is um, you know, very strong, uh, young woman. This is the steminist, right? This is the steminist who is leaving on a mission to Tahiti in six weeks, and. Um, just you know, knocked it out of the park in engineering her first year dean's list. Like smart, deeply thinking young woman, and we went on a bike ride last Thursday on her 19th birthday, and she she admitted because we started to feel a little bit more safe as we're riding in the canyon, and and it got a little bit more intimate, and she broke down into tears and admitted that um, my certainty about. You know, my angry, my, my, what did you call it? Hysterical feminism? Um, feminist rage. My feminist rage. <laughs> yes. um, within the context of the church that I come across with so much certainty, you know, that I'm never wrong. She just says, You're, you, you can't be wrong. You don't apologize. And it really gets in the way, mom. And she's choked up with our intimacy. So there's a lesson for me. Hmm. Thanks, Camille. Others, who's connecting to something on this slide? So um, I can check all the boxes for myself pretty much, except uh, I have a different story in that my husband was a convert and he was drawn to the church because he had kind of a tumultuous, you know, raised by a single mom. And but his mother was very open to to sex. In fact, he he's from England, and there their bodies they don't shame them, whatever size or shape. Like she would, his mother would walk around the house naked, and he would like it was just a normal thing. It wasn't a shaming experience for him, um, and so he recognized the repressiveness almost immediately when we were married. Um, but he w- he, his mother was open to having sleepovers with women in his bedroom and yeah, just very different upbringing. And of course he was, he was experienced and he was immediately, when, when we met, he saw me and uh, was attracted to who I was. And I, through my upbringing, brought in all of these um these issues that really affected but he but now i'm just seeing today it's just been really an epiphany like he wouldn't let me be arm's length he would kind of chase after me and say hey we're not gonna be buried underneath children and church our relationship is the most important thing And, um, but as a Mormon woman, uh, I felt responsible to keep him in line. Uh, I felt like it was my duty to, uh, make sure that he wasn't watching porn, that he, uh, wouldn't cheat, that he, like, like, uh, that was my duty to give him what he needed so that, you know, he, he wouldn't look elsewhere. <laughs> and I, I was the lower desire partner, but actually I don't think I was the lower desire partner. I think the, the most damaging message I received growing up was there are things that you can't, you shouldn't do after you're married that are against the laws of God, but we're not going to tell you what those things are. And so, uh, do you take your clothes off all the way? I don't know. <laughs> you know, do you? Do, I mean, all of these things where 
uh, you second guess because you're you're given these messages that like having sex before you're married is next to murder and you bring that with you in your marriage and as a woman now it's your responsibility and these are the messages we we see with with the modesty like it's your responsibility to keep your husband in line and I never knew if we were crossing the line and as we got more and more married and intimate and everything I'd always be like wow did what we do do last night was that even you know do I need to repent of that (laughs) and I'm a married woman you know and yeah and he and um and he made sure I mean for the first time I actually was uh I did have sex before I was married and so the going to the bishop repeatedly to confess my sins I I had nightmares about it years and years later the shame and around sex was suffocating and so um anyway that has has been my experience gratefully today I am so thankful that my husband had a different experience than I did growing up. And at the time, we were shamed for him being not a return missionary and being a convert. And, you know, having that experience, like that, that part of him was kind of hidden from the, wor- the world of Mormonism because it wasn't the narrative that we should have. But now I'm just so grateful mm. Amazing. so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of dialogue that didn't exist growing up so like as a kid your parents are sitting there you shut up and you listen to me and, and they tell you all these things and you don't have the chance to kind of have a voice and, and speak and so there's no the parent isn't listening to the child and the child isn't listening to the parent. It's the parent telling the child this, this, and this. And so for me, when I think of my parents and I was just making this connection is my whole life, I've never had the chance to have a voice and just sit there and tell them my kind of story and have them hear me. It was them telling me their story. And then, and so my whole life, I never had a voice. And so with my kids, the intimacy part is what I'm trying to do is shutting up and just listening to them and their story and and acknowledging and and repeating what they're telling me and listening to them and oh that's that's difficult and that must be hard for you and how can I help you with that and and so I think I think what was lacking for me and the the intimacy and, and this 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 ties into my relationship with my wife as well is having the dialogue and listening and and shutting up for a minute and not talking and and hearing that other person and then and then acknowledging what they're saying and, and validating those things. Like I, 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 when you when you say acknowledge some person that's in the audience that's hurting, and you validate that, like that's what creates I think the Im- intimacy maybe, and it, it creates that connection and that emotional intelligence maybe. So, thank you. So um, I'll check all those for me. I basically my house was an elephant. I had to like walk into and live in, in right? I lived in an elephant. But um, I've been sitting here and I relate to so many different things, but just the one short story I wanted to share that I think kind of started off our intimacy. That's, I don't want to say that. It didn't start, it's just one thing that just how the church kind of influenced our intimacy. So when we were first married young, we'd probably been married two months maybe, and he would, I was in this little apartment and I, he would come, maybe it was the first month, he would come home from work and I'd be like, naked, right? And like, oh, this is gonna be so fun. I can do this now, it's not wrong, it's not bad. And after like a couple days, he sat me down and was like, well, we're kind of supposed to wear our garments like day and night. And so it's not really like good that you're doing this. And it just like, it closed me so tight because I was so ready to be open and it was just like this this part of the triangle just like 
slam down on me. And now I know he feels bad. I know that that it wasn't his intention to do that, but that's how we were told to be, right? And so I, that's, and it wasn't even about the sex. It had nothing to do with sex. It just had to be, it was about me being free and open with who I am. I would go to a nudist calling, like I'm okay with bodies. But in that moment, I was told that who I am and what I'm okay with is not okay. Just one sec. And, and Jeremy, I just want to just say for you, that that's, can't be fun to hear in a public you know, arena. And I had a client last week with the almost an identical story. And it, it's actually an identical story. And... Um, you, you know, we talk about patriarchy and how it hurts women and children. Patriarchy hurts men. And you were simply trying to be a righteous priesthood holder as you were taught. That's it. It's, it's, that, it's that simple. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm, no but I'm just saying, like, we're all... And I, I also just want to say, we're going to keep referring to the church because that's our frame of reference. I don't know an institution that's good at nurturing healthy emotional intimacy. I... So I, I, I think this is just like new territory. I mean, Brene Brown is kind of like groundbreaking because before her, who was talking about this stuff in any really global, globally visible way? Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Mr. Rogers is great. Yeah, Mr. Rogers is great for sure. But, but, but he got associated with children. Yeah, and that's for children, but not for adults. And so that we're kind of breaking new ground really with this. And so I just let's just keep repeating to ourselves the Maya, the Maya Angelou quote, when you know better, you do better. And that's it. You did the best you could when you were there. And, and now you're going to do better because you know better. So this is a really good topic to show how both men and women are equally harmed in the church. And, you know, on the one hand, you've mentioned yesterday some of the good things that the church provides. And I think a lot of people might look at it and say, hey, one of the good things is it Overall, members are encouraged to be very industrious, very hard workers, and um, sort of, you know, uh, as units, as family units, everybody's sort of working towards all these different goals. And so it can appear like everybody's being very successful. But the downside to that is there isn't time for intimacy, first of all, even if it was known how to do it. Um, and it's unimportant to the goals. And so that's why it's not taught. You know, I mean, I think of statements kind of like, if you have the church in common, you could marry anybody and it would work. Um, you know, just as an extreme of um, this is unnecessary to even heaven. This is absolutely unnecessary. And, um, you know, for me, words have always been extremely important. I have always uh, felt my world in words and understood people with words. And so even as a child, I would... Um, assume that everybody was ready to use their words and explain themselves. And um, I, I, I learned that adults were extremely guarded, that people were scared to share and what have you. And I was constantly told, you don't ask this, you don't ask this, and stuff like that. And that didn't necessarily stop me, but... Um, one of the things that I try to teach my children, and I actually tell people that I see it as the most important thing I can do for them, is I teach them how to talk. Because they learn it too, how to talk English, or whatever language is in the house. But that doesn't mean they know how to communicate. And so I, I really push them to have to access everything going on inside and turn that into the words that work for them, um, even if it's hard and whatever, and it comes easier for some of my kids than others. But I'm like, what do I have to give you but 
knowing how to access yourself. And in human world, we do that with words. And so, you know, um, anyway. Thank you. So um, I wasn't raised in the church, active anyway, um, so I can't blame a lot of it of our, my husband and our emotional, in, not emo, yeah, emotional intimacy on the church. Um, I did witness a lot of um, emotional, like my dad was very shaming to my mother and um, so I witnessed a lot of that. They, they weren't, there wasn't a lot of communication going on or healthy communication, so it wasn't modeled for me. Um, and so most of, I don't know, I think my husband and I had very different expectations about what marriage was going to be. And um, I never, I've never felt like I've lived up to his expectations. He, he's a little bit older than me and a little bit, you know, into the, the typical roles that you, you know, husband and wife should have. And, um, I'm realizing now as I'm kind of going through this faith transition, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I wrote down that I'm avoiding <laughs> is talking to him. He doesn't, he doesn't know, he knows that I don't go to church, I haven't been to the temple in four years, but it wasn't until I stopped wearing my garments that he was like, oh, this is serious. I hadn't, I hadn't told him anything. I mean, I couldn't. I, I didn't feel like I could. I don't know what he believes. I'm learning that he believes, you know, that he believes that everything that the prophet said is doctrine and from God. And so, you know, for me to try to open up to him is, is terrifying. I don't know what his, um, well, I just learned what his political... <laughs> Um, beliefs are. I don't think he's would would love it knowing that I'm, you know, more active in feminism type things. Um, I feel like I have to hide that I'm going to support the LGBT community, which is because our children are are both LGBT. So, yeah, we need to, there is zero emotional intimacy in our, in our 26 years, and it's done a lot of, of damage, and thankfully we're, I feel like, both committed to trying to, to work it out. We love each other, and, and we want to work it out, so pray for us. <laughs> You said the word love. You know, we love each other, but we don't have emotional intimacy. Because that's another thing intimacy is not, is love. You can love the heck out of people. I mean, I think that we're a fairly loving community as Mormons, right? We really love each other, and yet we're not doing this intimacy thing well as a community, right? That's a great point. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you. Is there, do we have time for one and, more and we, comment, oh, we do. I mean, we're not just going to pray for you. We're going to put this presentation on the internet and as long as your husband won't be too hurt that you were so vulnerable hopefully this will be a tool you guys can watch together to help kickstart an improvement <laughs> in, in your relationship All right. that guy. Okay. Um, so my wife and I met 29 days later we were married had our first kid at like 19 months and we had kids every two years <laughs> so you fit for my... 10 years so we have six children um, I, I think that emotional intimacy wasn't ever really there matter of fact we had some major hardships and I don't know how we made it through but we have and the last little while things have really improved but as we have chosen another path leaving the constructs of, of what we both grew up knowing in the church. Real intimacy is taking place between her and I, but more pronounced now 
is with our children. Like, there's no conditional love. It's, it, I don't know, it's just taken down a, a, a tremendous amount of barriers to be able to talk to our children and figure them out and, and help them shape their life in a, in a healthy manner. Um, I, I think I can safely say that both my wife and I, growing up, although our parents did the best that they knew how, did not do a very good job teaching us any amount of emotional intimacy. So uh, this is one of the main reasons that, that we've come here. So I, I really appreciate the insights that each one of you are providing into a, a healthier life. So, thank you. Okay, one more comment. Okay, I know we have to move on, but I just wanted to maybe share the perspective of someone who can't check all those boxes. Um, I, I, I mean, I had a dysfunctional home in many ways, but my mom was very unconditional in her love. And so when I, when I see something like this, I feel like I'm approaching this from a place of privilege and luck. And I just sit here and stew in the shame that I can't provide better parenting for my children. I mean, I do apologize. I say I'm wrong. But um, I do quite a bit of fear-based parenting, and I'm extremely controlling. And so um, I sit here, and I, I just feel so bad about myself and wish I were a more evolved human being because I had more privilege, and I should know better. Um, and when it comes to emotional intimacy in my marriage, again, I feel very lucky and privileged because when my, I mean, I, I did get married older, and when my husband um, was in college, he was, went to a Ivy League school and had a mental breakdown and um, had to go to years and years of counseling and therapy and did cognitive behavioral therapy and act and, and journaled. So by the time we got married, he came with so many skills. And so when, um, you know, when, when I have issues or whatever, he can, he can actually, I, I mean, he's not a psychologist, but he can say like, do you want to mindfully watch your float thoughts float by or do you want to like beat the crap out of them by like writing them down you know I mean he, he has skills so that we can have emotional intimacy and so I feel very privileged in that way but also want to say that I think therapy works and there is hope that with treatment things do get better um, one more comment with regard to the the sexual intimacy piece um, I think honestly and I don't know what my husband would say about this but I think one of the the greatest gifts that I brought to the marriage was that I had premarital sex bef with not with my husband, but with someone before my husband, and so I have a reference point to know that I ch like I prefer him. Uh, not that I had sex with him before we were married, because but I was yeah. Anyways, but but I, I have a reference point, and I think that has really helped our marriage. I mean, it's helped my my perception of of things. Um, not that it's perfect, but. Having a reference point, I think, for me, is healthy, and it's something that I, I want to teach my children that is an option for them if they want, not to shame them into thinking mm -hmm. they have to. Thank you. One, I would just say one last thing before we move on is um, back on the other slide is you know the the current n narratives and scripts we're hearing about how to deal with doubts because there are so many people dealing with doubts and since this is a faith transition retreat from the pulpit is antithetical to intimacy, right? So pretend they're not there. So even with yourself, intimacy with yourself, right? Just pretend they're not there. Don't pay attention yeah, to the them. Shelf, the shelf is a barrier to intimacy because right. it's basically saying Ignore. any authentic concern, any way that your soul is crying out, noticing something that doesn't feel right, put up a wall. Right. <laughs> a shelf is a wall to yourself. And again, right. given our history and Joseph Smith's family, I think that's actually one thing that they did fairly well. They had a lot of family conversations about all kinds of religious ideas and thoughts. And I, mean, I don't know if there was tension necessarily, there was tension. but yeah. a lot of tension. But at least they were talking about yeah, it, right? right? And at least they were being, you know, yeah. open and yeah. honest about those things. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that and that was kind of what I wanted to say is that. Again, I, don't, I, I have no data to say that Catholics or Jews or Muslims or Hindus or do, do emotional intimacy better than Mormons. So we're not picking on Mormonism. But when you think about uh, kind of an Orthodox religion and when you think about uh, 
the, the, you know, the type of structure that would allow for that first half of life, build up the vessel kind of thing, it really is about a path. And so the focus isn't on what, as, um, as Heather was saying, the focus isn't on like, hey, five-year-old, what feels good to you? Hey, 12-year-old, what feels moral? What, what, what are your ethics, right? It kind of doesn't matter. It's like, get on, the, get on the train, this is where we're going. And so just, just an orthodox religion, just generally, is not gonna be concerned about the individual morals and preferences and needs and desires of the individual. And that's not, you know, there's good that comes from that and there's harm. And, and emotional intimacy is the casualty of kind of an orthodox structure, but it's also the opportunity of the second half of life. It's the opportunity of the faith crisis where now we get to have this awakening and instead of life being boring at 30 or 40 or 50, we've got a whole new domain that we need to learn how to conquer, which keeps it interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to put a positive spin on like things. Get framing, John. Get framing. <laughs> Natasha already alluded to this. Um, I was trying to find the best slide that I could, you know, as I was thinking about, well, why isn't this just natural? Like, if we all need it, if it's our core need, like, this is our core need, right? Is, there's nothing more important than this. Even if you want to say sex is the most important thing, you really, you know, in, in a most healthy marriage, you're not going to have great sex if there isn't good emotional intimacy because your partner won't feel safe on average. Um, and so emotional intimacy really is, I, I, I oftentimes put up the, the tree, Lehi's tree, and, the, and, the, and the, the glowing tree in Lehi's dream. Like for me, the plain and precious fruit the thing that's desirable above, above all things is emotional intimacy. And so why isn't it just natural? Because it's the thing we want most, right? If it's the thing we want and need most, why aren't we experts at it? <laughs> like we figured sex out, why didn't we figure out emotional intimacy? Please, uh, stand up and... Well, I was just, as I was listening to you and a few other people that have all these children at such a quick age, and they're right on top of each other, it's really difficult to stop what you're doing and say, how are you doing when you're just trying to keep them all in line so you can get from point A to point <laughs> yeah. B. Yeah, that's good. And the other thing is that's too, true. is I teach school and I really a new focus that we were trained on this year is on emotional intelligence and oh, social good. intelligence, yeah. a big push. We now have a counselor in our school that is there for the children. Um, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I'm all behind it. But coming from a realistic point of view, trying to teach 28, 10 year olds all day long, it's really difficult to stop and really care about what they think. Sometimes, and I think that's honestly where we're at in our lives with our family, with our neighbors and everything. When we've got to get from point A to point B, yeah. I really don't care what you're thinking right now. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get this done. I need you to sit down and be quiet so we can get this and this and this done. Bottle up what you're feeling, and then we'll talk about that some other day. And then some other day never comes up. So that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I've always been like that. Well, it's not important right now. We have to do this and this and this. So I think that it's really never been yeah. a high priority. Yeah, that's definitely one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Isaac, quick theory. I think it's because we're not authentic. We can't be trusted. Okay. We have a construct of we always have to be happy all the time. Um, it, it's like we're fake people. It's hard to trust fake people. So if you're not your true authentic self, yeah. there is going to be no, there, there's going to be barriers everywhere that are going to be hard to break down. That's, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm yeah. off on yeah, my yeah. thing. No, that, that's, I think just, that's all true. That's all true. Right. Yeah. 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 And back and then um, I think it is just so dang painful to be rejected there you go and to have people think your ideas are stupid or what you're feeling yep. is dumb so so it's that pain trying to avoid that pain is easier or better pays off more than not in the long run but at that moment just to keep your ideas or your feelings to yourself 
than to be, and especially as little kids, we're told, you know, like you said, there's, and kids are falling apart all the time. <laughs> They're always having tantrums, and you're like, I just got to get to the doctor, put right. your dang shoes on, I don't care if you want red or blue. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it. we're taught as little kids, just suck it up, you know, and if you and a lot of our parents weren't really raised with it either and it was a very right. you know tumultuous time so they especially males you know you're taught to just put on a stiff face and don't have feelings about that so yeah that's, that's all true idea. yeah thank you. thank you and and just to piggyback off of that i i, I this is going to betray how old i am but the slide that i uh chose to represent the biggest obstacle to emotional intimacy is that one. <laughs> Somebody's old like me. Yeah, I, I will submit that all that is true that everybody said, but the most, the, the most important reason why emotional intimacy is, is something that we avoid in fear instead of are naturally attracted to is because it kind of works like this. If you are to be emotionally intimate, it's basically to take your heart, you know, it's, you know, the, the heart is the defining organ that sort of like ends up determining whether you die. Because of course, when you're brain dead, you're dead. But why does your brain die? Because it stops getting the blood that it needs to survive. And so it's basically metaphorically taking this most precious organ, the most precious thing, you, who you are at your very center, taking it out of its protective shell presenting it to the person who um, you care for most in theory and who you're also literally naked with both physically and emotionally, which means you're the most vulnerable to them, right? And the prospect of doing that is that when you do present them with the most vulnerable thing you have, they might smash it and step on it. And I think that's, we, we can, What's that? We're not having time to look at it. Yeah, which is smashing it, right? Not being inter you mean just not being interested? Is that no, what you mean? No, just the busyness of life. Yeah, that, but that's how awful is that? That's almost worse. Like, you saw that quote from Robin Williams where it's like, the worst thing in the world isn't being alone, it's being with somebody and feeling alone, right? Like, it, like, them being too busy to really care about that heart that you present to them, that's almost more damaging. Ignoring is almost more damaging than actual criticism or rejection sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes ignoring or isolation is, is, is actually the worst form of torture. You know? Holly, did you wanna, are you raising your hand? I don't. I feel like I'm gonna like hyperventilate because this is really like hitting me right now, on a lot of levels. Um, because I, for the first time, I'm like figuring out what this whole concept of, of intimacy really is. And sorry. Um, I mean, I think if the reason we're all here because we were lacking that. I'm thinking about like the reason I removed myself from the church is because I, there was this disconnect, this like lack of connection, being around all these wonderful people who were uh, worshiping together and singing together and serving together, but there's like this disconnect and I felt it and I felt it in my marriage. And um, there's like one benefit to being apart from my husband and to being separated is that I have to like figure out who I am and sort of like date myself. So I'm here by myself this weekend and I'm doing a lot of things by myself and just realizing like who I am underneath all this stuff I've built myself up to be. And sorry, I'm like shaky. I think for me, the gift of all of this is the gift of the crisis. The gift of all of this is gaining this. So, 
Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Please. Just a quick comment to Holly. Um, I'm a military wife, and um, I've, he's gone on a lot of deployments. And I think that was one of the things we both come from really broken families and have, you know, fulfilled all those <laughs> quick marriage, lots of kids in a short amount of time, and had a really difficult marriage. But the thing that I think has saved us is that time apart. Um, or one of the things that saved us is that time apart when he goes on deployments and um, when he would leave, I, we, didn't, we didn't really connect very well over the phone. I, never, I don't like those phone conversations. Um, but he, so he's gone, gone, like emotionally and physically when he's on these deployments uh, at, for nine months to a year at a time. Um, but during those times, I have healed and figured out, like Holly said, dated myself. And I figured out who I am. And I found that during those times that I was strong. And I found out my own strengths. And um, it made me a better person. And it made me strong enough to, when he came home, to, <laughs> don't cry at me, <laughs> to, um, I just knew who I was when he came home. And I figured out who I was because, uh, our marriage wasn't good. It was, it was awful. It was almost, I would have left had I had a place to go. And, um, but I think that, oh, you're going to find that you are strong and you're going to figure out who you are and you're going to be a better person for this experience eventually. So. Yeah. You asked the question, um, why, if it's so important, is it not natural or seemingly not natural? And from my experience, it is absolutely natural. We're taught at a very young age that acceptance comes with conformity. And that is the death of intimacy. So, uh, you know, even the scriptures say, look at the little children. Learn from them. Because they, haven't, they still have the intimacy. And it's bred out of us by institutions. It's bred out of us by, you know, wanting to be accepted as part of something. And when you have something as strong as the church, as far as acceptance goes, it's bred out of you really fast. Thank you. The wisdom of our group, huh? Yeah. Margie's like, do you have any favorite like group members when they comment? And I'm like, no. What I love <laughs> is the wisdom of our group and the diversity of our group and the many wise voices. It's like a freaking orchestra, a choir. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. <laughs> one thing like listening is one thing that I realized too is like emotional intimacy with myself is severely lacking as well because I don't know how to hold myself in safety yeah and so i hurt myself right. and so i think you know you talked earlier before about unless you're you're okay it's hard to be okay with everybody else yeah. and so i think learning how to hold myself yep. safely yeah. is like super is like that's the one thing that's like standing out to me that i need to work on first before i can hold my husband or my children or my community of intimacy that's brilliant There's only one caveat I want to say to that because I think that's a beautiful idea and um, and I think it's it's very much in the pop culture you know work on yourself love yourself you can't be can't expect people to love you if you don't love yourself and um, and I think there's great truth in that and <laughs> I don't know what island we all get to go to when we get to do that <laughs> right? I don't know what job is going to give me a sabbatical <laughs> for my responsibilities or my children are like oh yeah mom just go work on yourself we'll take care of everything at home <laughs> right? and so I just want to remind us that um, we do this work in our community in our systems in our marriages, in our parenting styles. And the fact that you, I don't want it to feel like 
you're less than because you cannot offer everything to yourself. We are not wired that way. We are pack animals. And we have to have relationship. Back to the rats, right? In the maze <laughs> with the cocaine versus the cocaine and the, the community. So it really is a yes and. Like work on yourselves and understand that you need people who are going to validate you. And that doesn't mean that you're weak. That means you're a pack animal. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to talk to Holly and also to Heidi. Um, and to you, Natasha, I, I agree with everything you're saying, and... Yes, <laughs> um, I love I do, it. <laughs> I do feel like there are times when it is necessary for, your, for, for me, for my safety and well-being to make that separation so that I can find out who I am and what I need and then be able to come back to that relationship, hopefully stronger... Like Heidi was saying, a little bit of separation, um, hopefully to create a space where I can feel like I'm safe again, because because this is where I'm at right now. My heart is broken. <laughs> I, sh I shared my heart. And it was rejected. And, I, and I'm not safe. It's not safe. So I've, I've had to create space. Thank you. I'm, I'm in a very similar spot, so I understand what you're saying. And I, I hope what I'm what I said wasn't interpreted as space not being okay, because I totally agree. I totally agree. I think where I mean um, in pack form is whether that's with a therapist or a best friend or a sibling or, or a, a friend group. or a retreat group, <laughs> right? That's what I mean. Like it's, um, we do our, our solo work also usually best in conjunction with somebody, something, some entity that will not reject us. And in some ways, that's what therapy is supposed to be. I know that people haven't always had great relationships or great experiences in therapy, but it is supposed to be that blank slate where you can show up without the consequence of rejection, right? And so, um, so yes, yes. And not everybody deserves or has earned our heart or our intimacy attempts. Margie and I have had a few super hard things in our marriage, and there, there were a time or two where uh, I would have been deserved to be kicked out or, or for her to have left for sure, and, and vice versa. But um, just, a, you know, just, a, just a year and a half ago, like if you would have asked me, like in December of 2017, I would have said, our marriage is better than it's ever been, it's phenomenal. I couldn't ask for a better marriage. And um, that was on the, on the heels of, you know, us getting excommunicated, me getting excommunicated, which really excommunicated my whole family. Uh, we had a daughter who was uh, sexually assaulted as a senior in high school. We had some kids um, doing some identity work that was very significant emotional, you know, uh, element to our family dynamic. And then uh, Margie's dad died and then my sister died and we moved and there was this point where over a Christmas break uh, we kind of had a family argument uh, over Christmas break and the culmination of it was was to my just shock and horror Margie kicked me out of the house and here I am like a coach and a you know like a public figure and I, the, you know, for whatever in the past I, you know, did or didn't do, I didn't deserve that. In this case, I didn't deserve it. And I think Margie would agree with that now. But Margie was having her own emotional break because of all she had been through and was dealing with. And in her feminist rage or whatever we want to call it, in her midlife crisis, 
she was feeling too suffocated in our merged identities, especially with me as a public figure. And so I found myself looking for a home, you know, in late December, like between Christmas and New Year's of 2017. I'm like, where do I go? All my stuff is in my van, you know? I ended up calling Tom Christofferson because, um, I, you know, he had, I had just interviewed him and he just seemed like a dear man. And I didn't know who else to call. Like, who am I going to go live with as a grown-ass man? You know? Like, can I, can I, can I come live with you? You know? Because, <laughs> I, you know, like apartments were expensive. And, like, so Tom Christofferson took me in to his home without any questions. And I lived with Tom Christofferson for a month or two. Uh, while Margie and I got our lives back on track. But the point was Margie needed that separation. And it was the healthiest thing that she's probably ever done. And she w it was like cocoon into butterfly for her to have that separation. And, and when, what, what did she do? She ended up like, I'm going to become a life coach. And then she got her life coach certification. And then all of a sudden, once we worked out our stuff, she's like, I want to partner with you on podcasts and doing workshops and retreats. And I'm like, who is this woman? This woman wouldn't even go to a, you know, like a mixer with other people for years and years. She didn't want anything to do with any of the thing I did or any of the people. And that was just something she arrived at. And that's not the right conclusion. That was just what she found. But I just want to validate sometimes a, a, a structured separation can be transformative to a relationship. And sometimes you need to get divorced. Like there's not one way. And so I just wanted to be a little vulnerable and share that as well, because that was. Sorry. So some of the, these things are pretty deep. Um, as to, <clears throat> for instance, with my wife, uh, as an individual, you're going through these things, your own thoughts and your own feelings, and then you're processing them, and then. I don't know what her situation is, but if <clears throat> once you decide you're going to present it to your husband, uh, you know, it's a you're very vulnerable in doing that, but you need to also allow them plenty of time to process. I mean, they can't immediately, you know, agree with you or tell you you're right. It's going to take them, you know, days and weeks to process Four months. this, especially with the Four faith years. transition. So yeah. anyway, thank you. I like to tell the non, the non-believing spouse in a mixed faith marriage, how long did it take you to arrive at the, from start to finish to arrive at the place you arrived at? Can you allow your partner at least that much time for them to have their process? It's hard, it's, but it's hard, it's devastating. So. And it's that cyclical safety thing we talked about yesterday, right? That sometimes sometimes this is hard because you want to present your heart and just somebody say, I've got you, right? I've got you. But then maybe what you're presenting also hurts or helps them feel rejected, right? And so then now you're dealing with these kind of complex dynamics of the cyclical safety that um, is, is not feeling very safe for either one of you, probably, right? We should do a mixed faith marriage retreat and record it like this because that that could be really powerful yeah well this is beautiful so that's the other picture that i found you know once your heart's been ripped out of your chest that's kind of how you feel and who wants to that's you know donna that's what you're feeling and who wants to feel that way right holly that may be what you're feeling and, and many of others you've felt this way so the, this is the my best way of describing why this isn't natural for us at the most core psychological level, transcending Mormonism. So I think it's, um, well, let's put it on a nicer slide. Do we have a nice, let's put it on that one. What? I think it's time for a breathing exercise. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling it. <laughs> and I can see lots of you are feeling it. <laughs> Oh, so let's just, uh, well, let's put just on this slide for the <laughs> 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 so, 
So if you don't mind, I hope this isn't too corny, but I think it's just really good to just sit with ourselves for a minute and give ourselves grace. So if you just don't mind um, following my voice, and I'll close my eyes so you don't think I'm weird and staring at you. But if you want to close your eyes as well, that would be, that would be good. So just take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. Settle into this chair that's offering you support. Be grateful for the support that your body feels through the structure of that chair. Continue to breathe. Your main job as you listen to me is really just to relax into your breath and allow anything that comes up in your brain to just float around and be there. And at this point, I just want to honor that we've been talking about things that are in many ways painful. We've looked at our own backgrounds, our own stories, our own current relationships, the roles other people have played in at times contributing to feelings of rejection and sadness and worry for us. We've also maybe considered ways that we have also doled out rejection to those that we love and want intimacy with. That's a heavy space. And if you can, somewhere in your processing and assessment of your body, where would you say that space resides? Do you hold that space in your head, kind of like heat, or in your throat that feels closed up, or in your chest, like a heavy weight is upon it, or maybe in your stomach, where you feel maybe slightly nauseous, or even your pelvic floor that feels tense, or your shoulders, where does that reside for you? Give yourself grace for the fact that that is there. It is there for a reason. If you can try to give it a color or even turn it into an object, what would it look like? And once you have the object in your mind and wherever it is in your body, can you reach in with your fingers and pluck it out so that you can look at it and hold it and recognize it and validate it? And also understand that it does not have to be all powerful. Thank the object for giving you information that you desperately need to move forward. And now turn that object into something light. So if it was a rock, maybe now it can turn into a feather. If it was rigid, maybe now it can turn clay-like. And in some way or another, I want you to imagine that object either floating or flying or ebbing away from your presence. And you can notice it. And you can understand that it does not have to be something that you carry with you at all times. Thank yourself for doing this exercise with me. Continue to give yourself three or four more breaths. Allow for a, a light or a something uh, that feels maybe like it can soak you with something positive in the sense of hope for intimacy moving forward and the many different relationships you have. So if that's imagining yourself in the sprinkle of a light rain or in the sunshine of a bright day or in the snowflakes of a mountaintop, imagine that energy being hope that permeates every aspect of your body from your head to your cheeks to your throat to your chest to your back to your pelvic floor all the way down into your toes. Take two more deep breaths. And when you're ready, you can open up your eyes again.
Some of you may really like that. Some of you may think that was a waste of five minutes. It's okay either way. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Natasha plays the role of emotional circuit breaker. <laughs> it's like overload, emotional overload. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Anybody want to share if anything came up significant for you during that exercise? I would say maybe. If someone needs a bathroom two, break, you can run three of you. take a quick bathroom break. Yes. Right behind you. Uh, one thing you said, Natasha, that really resonated with me. Well, I, I also just want to make an observation um, that when Holly sort of broke, I feel like she punctured a, an emotional balloon. And that was an option, which was a great thing because I saw that it sort of opened other people up. And I just made that observation in my own mind that emotional int intimacy and being able to put your heart out there and take that risk um, kind of opens up other people mm -hmm. to want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but one thing that Natasha said that really resonated with me is I've tried to, this emotional intimacy idea has been a big theme in my life for the last couple of months as I've listened to some podcasts and things like that and I've kind of introduced that idea with my mixed faith marriage and she's coming at it from a different perspective. Um, and so emotionally in intimacy for her, for me, it's talking about the way what I'm going through makes me feel and it's almost like she views that as a, a little bit of an attack on what she holds dear because the result of that is that, you know, breaking covenants and that kind of fear, you know, that it brings up. And then her emotional intimacy to me is opening up to how it f makes her feel. The fact that, you know, she's posited, I mean, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but the, the message I'm receiving is that she is disappointed in me, that I'm being selfish in this endeavor, um, that uh, that's really heartbreaking for her, and that's her, that's her kind of cross the bear right now. And so, I don't know how to make that connection because we're, it's almost like we're pa talking past each other. I, I'm trying to be emotional intimacy, it's hurting her. She's trying to be emotionally intimate, it's hurting me. I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. I'm hopeful we'll be able to give some, some tips that are helpful, but we also have a full presentation on mixed faith marriages that we'll get to too. So we'll start by addressing it with today and either later today or in another retreat, we're gonna really tackle that directly. But th yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is this idea of toxic intimacy where each of you are offering intimacy and it's damaging the other, but you're both offering the best you can. And it's just, it, it becomes a mutual harm. And that's a great, it's a great topic that we could talk about. So thank you for bringing it up. Anybody have a reaction to the mindfulness exercise we did. Yeah. Just one thing I noticed is I was holding Jeremy's hand and as we were breathing, our breathing became synchronized. Mm. And that just was like, gave me a lot of hope that we can be synchronized again. Mm. Love that. <laughs> I've never done anything like that before. Um, but certainly meditation is something that I think is, I'm interested in that, that would help me um, kind of find that in yourself. And as we were sitting there like that, and we were holding hands, and I noticed that also. I also noticed, for some reason, I started to feel emotional. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. And um, trying to picture things and visualize things, and part of me questioned, am I doing it right? And then, you know, <laughs> but, I, but I'm getting emotional. As, and as I did, I felt that wall come up of, oh, no, I can't break down right now she'll know people will know and, and, and I kind of it, again it just taught me that that I've I've got to be able to let go a little bit more mm. um, and that is something I need to work on but it was a very uh, very cool thing to do thank you very good thank you all right thank you Natasha so because of that one of the ironies uh, one of the ironies of this emotional intimacy dilemma is that we, 
we actually spend a lot of our lives actively and maybe subconsciously avoiding or undermining the intimacy that we desperately need out of fear of rejection. So we are, when it comes to emotional intimacy, we're usually our own worst enemies out of fear and out of a desire to self-protect. And you'll see this dynamic at play when like one spouse bids, the other spouse kind of withdraws. And then there's like this detente or like cool down and then the other spouse will bid and then what does the original spouse do? They withdraw and it's almost this cat and mouse game. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod. And that's because we both want it and need it, but we're both terrified of it. And so we do this cat and mouse of pursue, withdraw, pursue, withdraw, because we're just terrified. <laughs> we're terrified. So um, we don't need to go into the self-medication, but when you go too long without the thing you need most, it really starts to wear you down. You start to get depressed. You start to feel awful all the time, lonely, sad, longing, and it's just not good to feel those feelings all the time. And so we, we do turn to Netflix or to podcasts or to drugs or alcohol or, you know, pick your avoidance, sometimes infidelities, just when, when we're trying to medicate away the loneliness and the sadness and the pain. And we won't go in today to the ways that we self-medicate, but again even serving others, being a workaholic, having some cause, being a social activist, other friends, girls' nights out, guys' nights out, affairs, control, anger, parenting. Parenting is like a supreme form of avoidance. It's like, well, I gotta worry about the kids. The kids have needs, the kids are in trouble, and it can be just a wonderful excuse for never risking opening up your heart to somebody. Uh, and yeah, it's really important to know that unhealthy coping mechanisms doesn't mean the thing is unhealthy, nope. right? So scrapbooking, pornography, I kind of put them at the same category. <laughs> right? They can both be used in... <laughs> Just mommy, mommy porn and daddy porn. Well, it depends. There's mommies and daddies that like both of those things. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, we often like to blame a thing, and in, in our culture, no. certain things no. have been taboo, right? And yeah. so I just say both of those things can be used in really wonderful ways, and they can both be used in really um, very harmful ways, right. right? So that's let's not get caught up on the thing. No. And yesterday we had, I think Mehdi talked about hyper-exercising as a way to avoid, right? right. It, it, you know. Whereas we would see exercise is a really good thing, usually. Right? And, and viewing audience, listen to our presentation from yesterday to learn, to learn about um, just this idea of coping mechanisms are actually healthy. They can, be, they can save our lives. So we're not shaming any of these coping mechanisms per se, but what's important is to understand what's the function of the behavior. If the function of the exercise is to be fit, that's different than if the function of the exercise is to keep from having to go home to face your partner or children, right? So the function is, is important. Uh, and who doesn't love Netflix, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, again, we live our lives running around frantically trying to avoid the thing that we desperately want and need most. Um, and that's a picture of Javert from Les Miserables, and we'll talk, we can talk about him another time. But we bring these intimacy models into our marriages and our kids learn them. And uh, so I'm just gonna skip that slide. So here we are, we are now finally at the point <laughs> where we're gonna lay out, then the processing is brilliant. I, don't, I mean, Clint was really wanting us to focus on processing and I just love the wisdom that's, that's coming out and the diversity of thought. So uh, I love that we're doing this, but this is a little bit unique. We usually would be done with this presentation by now, but <laughs> now we're just starting the core of the presentation. Eight essential ingredients for healthy relationships or for real emotional intimacy. So here we go, you guys ready? All right, number one. We talked about this yesterday and we did an entire session on, uh, on mental health, right? So we're probably not gonna spend a ton of time on this other than to say, if you're not physically and emotionally healthy, um, it's gonna be really hard for you to be in a, in a to, to engage in emotional intimacy with others and vice versa. If the person that you're trying to 
be emotionally intimate with is not well. It's gonna be, it's probably not safe to even try this. You know, it's like, don't try this at home, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, if you have a partner who's a diagnosed narcissist, if you have a partner who's clinically depressed and they're not treated, if you have a partner who's doing experiencing chemotherapy right now, like, just imagine all the different ways someone can be either physically or mentally unwell you know, you want, we talk about, and we'll talk about this, you want to gauge the, the, the level of intimacy that you seek to engage with based on your partner's health and safety and capacity for engaging. So let's just say it's zero to five. Zero means they're abusive and completely unsafe. You want to match that, right? But if there are two or three, you match at that level and you save the fours and the fives for the people who really have earned your trust and deserve your trust. Um, be, because again, you don't want to try that. You don't want to just throw your pearls before swine. You don't want to open up your heart to someone who you know has a proclivity to, proclivity to stomp on it, right? So I don't need to say much more about that, um, but we certainly, I would love to hear if you have additions and if there's any processing we want to do, that's step one, is don't try this with an unsafe person. Or when you're not well, get well before you try this. Would you add, what would you say? Well, I know that like from a therapy perspective, I hear a lot of people again, you know, and even colleagues will try to um, compartmentalize some of this. Like, well, I won't see you as a couple until you go and get some individual therapy. Um, that has not been my approach just because again, I don't know that our, our our lives stay on hold, right? It's not like I can very neatly, oh, I'll deal with this little problem and then I'll come back and deal with this little problem. It's, things are so intertwined. So, um, but I was trained in systems theory and so I'm more comfortable dealing with multiple kind of issues at the same time. So depending on the therapist, you might get different approaches. I do think it can be, um, some people said it's contraindicated to do marital counseling while doing individual counseling on certain topics. And I guess I would just challenge that most of the time, <laughs> most of the time. I think there's issues with domestic violence where that needs to work. Safety does need to be prioritized first. Um, and this whole idea of measuring, I don't know, do we have, a, we have another slide that really goes into that more, isn't it? The whole measuring safety or not, or is this the time to do it? Okay, well... I do think that after learning about intimacy, most of us are like, woohoo, we want it, let's go get it. You're probably crying because you're thinking of all the people in your life you want it with, right, and realize it's not there. And, um, and I just really need to just kind of make sure you have realistic expectations about it. Because like John was saying, not everybody can offer what is being offered. And so, Safety is a really big issue, and I, and I think, against trying to get away from black and white thinking that we're all so well <laughs> acquainted with, uh, we really want to spectrum the idea of intimacy so that you'll have some relationships where you do have the 10, you know, the really intimate relationship where you can pretty much say anything you want and you feel safe and um, it's reciprocal and... Um, and then you'll have people that you have a zero with, which you don't want to necessarily maybe have any relationship with. And many of your relationships will actually, the, the majority of them will be somewhere in the middle. And that's because intimacy requires a two-way street. You can only have as much intimacy as two people are willing to engage in. And so even if you may be at an eight with your mom and she's at a four, then there's going to be some grief work you're going to have to do there because even though you may desperately want a more intimate relationship with certain people in your life, they may not be equipped or have the skills or they may have their own uh, physical and psychological issues and or, or their interests or values. But even, even more than that, coming from an Orthodox religion, I think a lot of people have the intention or value or desire I think if you ask most Mormons if they want intimate relationships with their children, they would say yes. But again, they are coming at it from a very ill-equipped space. They're not going to a lesson on intimacy, right? And so they have been taught to, uh, really it's been conflated with getting you to the celestial kingdom, especially your, your parents, 
right? So their, their way of protecting and loving you is to reject your faith transition oftentimes. That's their way of loving you. And it's very sincere. And it comes from a place of deep concern and love. That's why several of you mentioned you can't handle the thought of disappointing your parents or telling your parents. And I think it was, I forget her name now, and she's gone right now, but um, her brother went through it, right? She saw her brother go through it, saw how much pain that caused her parents, and she doesn't want to now open up to them about something that's going on very personally. So that's interfering with intimacy. And that's why it's, again, important to not conflate intimacy with love. I'm sure many, many people within our community love us desperately and yet are acting in very rejecting ways, right? And that interferes with intimacy. And we also can do the same in return because we're feeling rejected, right? So we get defensive and all of those things. So I do think it's really important to have realistic expectations, to kind of go through an assessment in your mind. Who are the people that I really want to develop intimacy with? What is my... um, What is my prognosis for that really being able to happen, given what I know about this person personality-wise, circumstance-wise, orthodoxy-wise, et cetera? And how do I match my expectations to that with hope, with hope that it can improve, but not devastation if it doesn't? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, and I I definitely believe that sometimes individual therapy and simultaneous couples therapy is is very valuable so I'm certainly not one of those that thinks it needs to be serial Uh, but this is particularly difficult because there are spouses or parents who aren't interested in this model or literally aren't capable of it and um, and that those are some of the most difficult situations and so uh, it's good that we focus on that so that's that's point one I think we've covered it um, is there anybody who just feels like they um, have something to share about that? I mean, this would obviously ask you to call out somebody potentially in your life, and we don't, you know, yeah. I don't know if this is related to what you're saying, but this is what keeps coming to my head. Um, um, different levels of intimacy with different people. Um, like, even in my marriage, I don't, I'm not 100% intimate with Isaac, um, and a lot of times I'm more emotionally intimate with my girlfriends than I am with Isaac. I don't, is that what you're talking about? No. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, how are we going to define intimacy? So you may, you know, have a certain style of sharing that's maybe more fun or open with your girlfriends than me coming home and how you talk to your husband. Um, but I think... It, I think ultimately we're just thinking about intimacy from the perspective of, am I seen? Do I feel safe? Can I come to this person with my concerns? Can I um, feel accepted and loved regardless? Uh, There might be different styles of that. There may be times where you might enjoy hanging out with your girlfriends more than your husband. (laughs) But you also have a different relate. You don't don't go home with your girlfriends. You don't pay bills with your girlfriends. You don't raise kids with your girlfriends. So in some ways, certain friendships will be lighter, a lighter intimacy. Well, it's even more like spiritually Isaac's always struggled with like having you know uh, the relationship with God thing has been really important during this um, conference for me and he's always struggled with that and so I go to my girlfriends that also feel the same way and so I'll, I'll be spiritually intimate with them where I can't do that with Isaac at all and, and I really love the work of Esther Perel as, as one really good role model and reference point for healthy relationships I want to she has a podcast she has a couple books and she makes the point that the way marriage has evolved, it has evolved in a very unrealistic way where we expect our partners to be our lovers, our best friends, the best, you know, parents, you know, the provider, the, you know, the therapist, the parent, the, you know, the teacher, like you go on and on and on about, and, for, and not just for 20 years or 30 years, but for like, 70 years and she makes the point that our our expectations in these monogamous relationships sometimes have spun out of control and she makes the point that it's impossible for any partner to meet all of those needs 
at all times for 70 years. And so instead, she says it's very, if you can find a partner that meets 75 or 80% of your needs, you're actually doing fantastic. So it is absolutely okay for you to have girlfriends that meet some fun needs or some joy needs or some spiritual needs if, if you know, your partner right now isn't always able to meet all those needs. Yeah. That and another be. theme that I heard you say there that maybe we should also put on the slide of what intimacy is not <laughs> is sameness. We got, well, that's point eight. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll get to that. But yeah. so you can connect with people that have similar things that your partner may not have similar either interests or beliefs on, but that doesn't mean that you're having less or more intimacy. So that's step one is, is do your best to, to be as well as you can and to assess the wellness of your partner. What's hard is you can't make your partner either one, want emotional intimacy, uh, and they may not value it, or you, you can't make them go to therapy and you can't make them get well. You can't force them to want to open up. And so that's, that's a lot of you might get stuck just in the point that you don't have a partner or a parent or a child or a friend who's, who's actually interested in this. And that, that's an unfortunate, you, 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 it has to be reciprocal. So that's, that's a tough reality. Alex. Um, so you talked about mentioning this, you might have to call out some people. Um, <laughs> the person to call out is myself. <laughs> um, looking at some of these slides and what, what, what everyone said, um, I think my marriage is at kind of a point where my wife has, has wanted this emotional intimacy for, for years. And my whole life growing up, I've put up walls and I've gotten really good at distancing everyone from myself. Um, and so when I see becoming psychologically healthy, it's taken years to get to that point and um, a lot of therapy <clears throat> and now I feel like I'm, uh, the, all of this, it, it feels like I'm sitting in my therapist's office the last couple of weeks because this is what we've been working on, <laughs> of how can I get to the point where I can open up, put my heart out there, because my greatest fear is that it's going to get stomped on. Um, and, and the easiest natural thing for me to do is to just reject that, reject my wife and, and not open up. And she's craving that. And so um, I'm on the end where it, I'm the one that needs to, to make that effort. Um, but I've come to realization that I couldn't over the last few years because I wasn't ready. Yeah. And now I think I'm, I'm a lot more ready to, to open up and do that. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. And and doing that introspection. Uh, a second point that we're offering today is common values. The next slide is uh, providing unconditional love, but the truth is I don't think any of us really believe in total unconditional love. In other words, if you have a partner that punches you in the face or you know, sleeps around serially without telling you and without an agreement or an understanding, or if they're in any way other verbally or emotionally abusive, or abuse the children, or neglect their core responsibilities. You know, if you, have a, of a, if, if you don't share enough common values and enough commitment to the same common values, unconditional love just becomes this glib buzzword that actually is meaningless. So this is why we, we spent so much time yesterday on that values exercise and the mental health presentation. Uh, this is why I've urged all of you to do your own values assessment. And the next step is if you're gonna try and have emotional intimacy with a partner or parent or kid, to do a mutual values assessment to make sure you're, um, you're building on a, a similar platform, that you have enough of a contract to say, these are the bounds of our relationship that neither of us are, are going to violate. Because again, that, that's a prerequisite for engaging in deeper levels of emotional intimacy. If, if I'm okay with punching and you're not okay with punching, then maybe, maybe it's an irreconcilable difference, right? Um, and again, if I'm interested in emotional intimacy and you, that's the last thing in the world you want 
you, you have a values discrepancy that at least right now may not be, may, may, may be a non-starter. So, so do the values assessment individually and collectively when you can. It's maybe hard to sit mom down and say, mom or dad, what are your values? These are mine. But I actually think there could be a lot of power in that if you're willing to kind of break out of that mold and just say, let's put religious words aside for a second. I'm not talking about you value church attendance or reading the scriptures. Let's go underneath that a little bit. I value love and honesty and kindness and compassion and unconditional love and service. What do you value? Can we have that be the foundation of our, our relationship now that the church is no longer able to be um, the foundation of our relationship? I think we still share 98% of the values, mom or dad or partner. Can we have that be the explicit named foundation of our relationship so the church doesn't get in the way with the more important connections? Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think that a lot of people do get unconditional love mixed up with limits or boundaries, right? And so uh, even going back to the comment from the teacher in the back row, <laughs> you know, there, there's first of all different styles and, and roles that you play. You're going to have a different type of intimacy with a five-year-old than you are with your spouse, right? And, and there are certain roles like a teacher or a parent or a police officer that are necessary at times and that are going to limit or at least look different in intimacy style and texture than maybe with a best friend or a partner. Um, and I think a lot of people think of unconditional love from this perspective of, well, then anything goes. Anything goes. And, um, and it's through the work of, well, a lot of people before Brene Brown, but Brene Brown brought it to the kind of like the the, the, the awareness of a lot of people is this idea that unconditional love does best with good boundaries. And that's something that we haven't really necessarily been taught how to do. And sometimes boundaries can feel harsh or difficult or unkind or unloving. And so then how can that be unconditional love? But you can unconditionally love somebody that you have decided to divorce from. Or you can unconditionally love a child who you've set some parameters about whether or not they can continue to live in, their, in your home when they're 28, right? Or use your monies in certain ways. Um, so by, by sure, we can offer unconditional love, which is much more about respecting the person and their weaknesses and their strengths and where they come from, as well as respecting your own. And then hopefully, depending on the type of relationship, you can either in an egalitarian way contract what your boundaries are going to be, like in a marriage, or maybe not so egalitarian as in a you know, small child or other things, but it's still from a space of respect and love. So I know those can be kind of confusing concepts, yeah. but they're good things to be thinking about. They interweave. And so point two is common values. Point three is the unconditional love that we've already talked about. And point eight includes boundaries and differentiation. So let's pause for a second. And as you're here um, thinking about the partner you want to have a relationship with or a parent or a child or whoever, how do you bring in, I'm just interested in the processing part, how do you bring in values, unconditional love to kind of that equation with, with whoever you're thinking about right now? Do, do, do the issues of common values and or unconditional love factor into the relationships that are top of mind for you right now? Well, going back to my, my broken wheel issue that I always bring up is uh, my uh, mixed faith marriage. Um, what I think I'm grappling with and coming to realization of is I need to love my wife exactly how she is and how she wants to be. And if that includes that she wants to be in Mormonism the rest of her life and doesn't want to listen to a thing about truth claims and all this stuff, I got to get over that. That's the thing I'm grappling with and that's hard. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the unconditional love, I'm a hypocrite if I can't love her and let her be in that space that she loves. <laughs> so. Wonderful. 
Bingo. Uh, profound. Bingo. And what where that gets where that's where that's actually complicated, but where the growth opportunity is, is it's not it's it's a little bit more sophisticated than that because how you your new worldview is important to you, even if it's secular or alternatively religious. And the one of the difficult most difficult parts of a mixed faith marriage is you are desperately wanting to be able to talk to the person who's most important to you in your life to have them see you now, right? So it's, it's not just a matter of now I'm going to just let her be religious and never talk to her about any of the things that come through my mind in my new worldview because that's, that's running counter to this idea of into me seeing. You want to be seen by her. You still need to be seen by her or you will grow apart. And then when you grow apart, you, you can grow apart too far and, and that bridge becomes, that distance becomes too far and irreconcilable. And so the trick is not how do I just let her be religious and I'll go be secular and we'll just go live our different lives in the same household. It's how do you learn to communicate in a way where you can, you can help her feel safe enough to start seeing you for who you are now in a way where she doesn't feel attacked or threatened about who she is. Because it's still very important for you to be seen. And the truth is, believers are not simplistic and monolithic. Believers have nuancy and complexity too. Like, is it Abe? Like Abe, right? Or Robert, yeah. And so, um, and so can you not put the TBM label on your partner as if you get everything about them because you perceive them as a TBM? And can we as non-believers let that down and allow them to say, actually, you're, you're stereotyping me. You've got me wrong. You're applying your perception of the brethren's construct of what it means to be a believer on me when really I'm a complex, even as a believer, I'm a complex, nuanced person too. I don't agree with everything that I'm told. And I, I have a different type of Mormonism. And why are you making it that I have to be a certain type of Mormonism? Because that's what you perceive Mormonism should be, or that's the way you perceived a good Mormon needed to be. Can you allow me, can you see me for, for who I am in my belief, right? And so that's the trick. How do you kind of put religion to the side and just focus on seeing each other really without a way that makes either of you defensive. That's the trick. So yes, you hit the nail on the head. And I want to say, you, we, you know, you have to still go for the seeing part, right? And well, that's and the you, complexity. Where you really got yeah. it right is that the strategies that we're going to teach you, whether today or in mixed faith marriage retreats, have very little to do with doctrinal truth has to do with relational skills, curiosity, respect, so that even if doctrinal issues come up, you're, that's not your main focus. And I think we've been taught through that missionary lens to focus primarily on the doctrinal or historical aspects. And that's, so you're absolutely right in that sense, that it will require something different than that. Here, here yeah, go ahead. We have three people. So, um I don't know if anybody else here feels this way, but I know probably until fairly recently, I, I equated everything with him not, my husband not loving me. So rather than, you know, he can be angry and love me, I just always felt very unloved because he always was disappointed or silent. And so I would make up a lot of things and um, about what he was thinking because he didn't share it with me. So learning that he does love me and he can be disappointed, just the same, you know, I can, I still love him and I'm angry with him, you know, but so I don't know if anybody's had to learn that too. <laughs> In my experience for me, what it usually boils down to is how important is the issue? Is it a deal breaker? Is it a situation where I want to sever a relationship or not sever it? 
And usually, and I, I think this applies to, to you, and, and how much of myself do I have to lose in order to accommodate the other person? And am I willing to do that? And if I can find that I can, I can live within that dynamic and it's not going to make me lose too much of myself, then I, I'm saying, okay, this is not a deal breaker. But if it gets to the point where, and I, and I think this happens a lot, and it's mainly why we're here, I think is the idea that we lose too much of ourself. At that point, it becomes too dramatic to continue in that situation. So as hard as it is, and it's a dance of intimacy, okay, you got to decide whether you can actually get to the core issue and how important it is to you. And if it's that important, whether you're on one side or the other, you have to find a middle ground or just, you know, decide that it's a deal breaker. Two more, I think. Back okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just want to ask the question of self-sabotage. Because I did a lot of that because I wasn't worthy of love. So even with my children, you know, I could love them, but I couldn't accept their love because I wasn't worthy of it. So there was a lot of self-sabotaging going on. And, you know, how do you address that? I think that's what you were saying, Jessica, is like, this starts with yourself, right? Yeah. How do, you, how do you unconditionally love yourself? How do you get clear on your values? You know, and, and, and really, we have eight points for intimacy. You could literally go through it and, and say, how do I practice doing this with myself, right? How do I practice unconditional love? How do I practice being vulnerable with myself? How do I get still and get to know who I am? to develop a deeper personal understanding of myself because that'll help you be in a better relationship. How do I spend quality time with myself <laughs> instead of my partner? You know, like, and that was the whole point of dating yourself, which, which Heidi, Heidi, right? Heidi made the point. What? Yeah. And, and a commitment to your own well-being, right? This is going to be point six, but how do you develop a fierce commitment to your own well-being where you're more important? And I'm kind of going, jumping ahead here, but the point is, um, yeah, it, we sabotage ourselves. And so I'll just turn it around and say, instead of focusing on these eight points for your relationships with others, see how much of these eight points are individual work that you need to do with yourself first. Does that make sense? And that's part of the getting healthy part of the first point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Some thoughts that are coming up for me from both of your comments are we are constantly in tension with me versus we, right? The me versus we is a constant tension, whether it's our partners, our children, our extended families. And, um, and I do agree that there are deal breakers. It's kind of where the boundaries are and the contracting and the idea. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the research on cutoffs are not, is not very good. So the idea that, well, I'll just cut this person completely off from my life especially if it's a family relationship, doesn't show that it does that well for your mental health. It, it, oftentimes it's kind of like a backfire effect. They become more important in their absence in your life. So again, using that measurement scale of may I need to go from like my expectation of an eight to a two, a two is better than like a cutoff usually. So if you have toxic people in your life, maybe figure out a way that you can do a yearly letter or something that that helps you feel that me versus we versus a complete cutoff i'm not saying that's a sweeping statement but in general the other thing that i think is very important to consider so that we don't get into this win-lose mentality is i really like to talk about systemic authenticity this is more in my marriage class but i'll just share this here um a, a very popular word for us as, you know, nuanced or post-Mormons is authenticity, right? And authenticity is so important because I think we have felt so um, driven by other people's expectations of us, other people's, you know, the institution or our families or God per se idea of what we should be or how we should be. So now we're in this kind of like we, we do the pendulum shift where I will do nothing, nothing that I don't want to do and that I don't, you know, that I'm not a 
100% okay with, right? And yet that is contraindicated to any relationship. Any relationship. So we've gone from here over to here, and I'm just saying maybe we want to land somewhere in the middle. And this idea of systemic authenticity is I can do things that maybe if I wasn't in this relationship, I would rather not do. And the typical example I give is changing poopy diapers. (laughs) Nothing authentic for me about changing poopy (laughs) diapers, right? So why have I like changed thousands of them? Right? And not just for my own children, but for my like nephews and nieces and kids I babysat for and even my friends' kids, right? Why would I do that? Well, because there is something authentic in me being a caretaker in certain positions, of me being a mom, of me being a friend, of me being, you know, uh, concerned about a child's well being, right? So when you think about the me versus we, it can be, it's not that it's just me and I'm being inauthentic if I go to church with my believing spouse, or I'm being inauthentic if I keep my garments on for another six months while my spouse, you know, transitions with me and, and you know, maybe, or I'm being inauthentic if I go to the blessing of my brother's baby because I no longer want to be part of this quote unquote cult. You can do those kinds of things in a very authentic way for other values. Again, this is why it's so important to go back to your values. Because I can go to the blessing because my value is my relationship with my brother and what he really holds dear in his life, even though you know, I don't like going into this building anymore. Or I can wear the garments because even though they don't have meaning to me anymore, I understand that my spouse still feels like that has to do with our vows and our commitment to one another, and I care and love for that person. So I will do something uncomfortable for a season or a time or every now and then um, until things shift or change or have a transition, and I can do that from a very authentic place. Does that make sense? Or until you can't do it any longer, right? Right. Yeah. And I think Lily, did you did you raise your hand or did someone back there? Okay, okay, okay. There's something to respond right here, just real quick. Yes. So, um, what's your name? I just don't want to. What's your name? Oh, Kim. Kim. Okay. So I related very much to your comments around self sabotage, and something that comes up for me around that, in particular, is, you know, the difference between cognitively processing something and knowing what you should do, and like that connection emotionally, right? And that's something I feel very, very much for. And with regard to self-sabotage, when it comes to intimacy in particular, one thing that I have found helpful, and sometimes with my clients being helpful, is to actually process emotionally. So that would look like something like going back to the girl you were. Where did you start having these messages that people leave you? that you're not good enough, that people will reject you if they see who you really are, and to really start looking at where that started. And then if you come upon pivotal moments, sometimes for people, there are memories in particular that you can feel kind of, it shifted who you were, right? Is to go meet yourself there. Like as an adult woman, to go back to the child you were, to go back to the teen you were, and show up for yourself in an emotional way to see that person trying to cope the best they were and to rewrite as best you can. Sometimes that emotional work can be a key component to sort of the integration of what we know, but what we can't bring forth for whatever reason. I'm kind of processing my answers to myself. So part of me wonders if I should even be asking this question. But um, the thing that comes to my mind when I see this slide, unconditional love and authenticity, I think of the relationship I have with my mom and how difficult that is to navigate because I so deeply appreciate the unconditional love she has offered me my whole life and continues to do so. But I, I don't know how to be authentic with her without wounding her because her um, perception of 
I mean, we have a values-based relationship, but her primary value is the church. And so her self-identity is the church. And, and at the same time, she wants emotional intimacy with me. I want emotional intimacy with her. That's something that we've always had. And so when I am authentic with her, because right now the most important thing on my mind right now is this transition of belief and this shift in identity. So when I try to share that with her, I can perceive that that's wounding her. But she wants to know because she wants that relationship. And so this we're in this kind of catch-22 of continually wounding. I'm, I, I feel like I'm this person who is continually offering my mom pain, and she's only ever given me love. And, and it feels like such a deep betrayal. And it also feeds into my self-narrative of I'm such a bad person. I'm surrounded by these wonderful people. I'm so privileged. I've been given everything. And here I am betraying all this love, all this kindness, all this understanding that they offer me. And I, I don't know quite how to navigate that. Okay. So, um, so there's so much beauty in what I just heard you say that actually for me does uh, fit the definition of intimacy, right? So what I'm hearing is that both you and your mother value knowledge about each other more than you value comfort. So intimacy isn't always comfortable. And if you could frame it that way, right? Like mom, you know, I, I talk about the sandwich approach, right? So mom, I, you know, I've always felt so loved by you. The fact that you are willing to be uncomfortable with, with the things that make you sad about my life is incredible for me. The fact that you're open to me sharing some of my new ideas and some of my new feelings, even though I know it's so painful for you. Mom, I can't tell you how much that means to me. And then, you know, so yeah, I have been thinking this, right? This is where the meat is, right? That was the bread, now the meat. So yes, I have been thinking this differently. Or, and then when maybe she tears up or whatever, you go back to the bread. It hurts me to hurt you. And yet I know that we are closer because you let me talk to you like this, Mom. And I love you so much. Thank you so much for offering me this. That is intimacy in pain. And it's okay to have intimacy and pain. Beautiful. And just because I, I want to be able to make sure we address, um, if I don't need to add anything more because this was such a beautiful exchange, but I do want to add a tiny bit. And that's just that sometimes we confuse um, pain with harm. The truth is there's no growth without pain but we think I don't want to cause my mom pain or I don't want to cause my children pain. But the truth is that, that if, if B equals C, then what you're saying is I don't want my mom to grow and I don't want my kids to grow. Protecting your kids or your parents from pain could be protecting them from growth. And there are parents who are not growth oriented, who don't have a growth mindset. And so that's where the dial of zero to five or zero to 10, you know, in those types of relationships where, you know, like with my dad, there are limits to his ability to grow at 85. And I've tried to talk to him about progressive politics or to help him see why liberals may not be evil or dumb, you know, or <laughs> why he, might not say certain things to my daughters, you know, whatever it is, there, there are caps to his ability to change at this point. And so in those instances, and my, my dad's lovely, he's amazing, but in those instances, you do have to kind of dial it down and just say, this is going to be a, a seven, or this is going to be a five, and you have to mourn and grieve that. But having said that, um, you know, it's not... Ideally, it's not a child's job to, job to protect their parents. I think I, I hear this from Natasha, you know. So, so who knows? One of the beautiful discoveries may be that, that this pain actually helps your mom grow in new ways at whatever age she's in. And that's the, the, the opportunity. You can't get more Mormon than that. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, 
like our trials are meant for our growth, right? right? And so, right. And, and it goes back to that original point I made about protective intimacy, that we've been taught that it is loving and intimate to protect people from our truth and our pain. And in fact, intimacy is all about pain. It really is all about pain in many ways. And for, for many of you, just know whether it's having an LGBTQ child or a, a, a sibling or a child that loses their faith, time can really heal wounds. And so if you can just sort of like grit and bear that initial pain and discomfort, have a lot of authentic discussions, one, two, three, five years down the road, you will be surprised with the right person how much growth they're capable of, right? Yeah. So it sounds it sounds like you have a beautiful opportunity. Let's let's have Heather and then Mitty. So I just wanted to say one thing that really hit me with this what you're presenting. Um, the concept of values, it made me realize this is where our humanity lies. Like if we're actually going to see each other as fully human. Um, and not just how we how we do right now. We're very polarizing. We're very reactionary. We're very. If you voted for who, I'm unfriending you. If you stand, don't stand with me or stand against me, I'm throwing you out. And um, very much a what kind of person could agree with or support or what have you. Um, and it makes it so that we're willing to harm one another, whether that be a full-on war, whether that be genocides, whatever that acts like. You know, it could just be a, a local decision to defund something that really helps people that we no longer see as human. And um, I, I was thinking of my dad and... Um, how I always thought he and I were very similar. And then um, recently he became, he uh, politically um, helped run some campaigns in his state for he who shall not be named. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, and I would talk to him about that and try to understand and um and then when you know i was when i was in law school that's when um the kavanaugh confirmation was going on with dr ford and and i remember asking him um well dad would you have believed me if i had ever been abused and come to you and he said no and i appreciated his honesty but I remember feeling so hurt because he told me he believes that women lie. And um, so he, uh, he's always been very honest. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of things that have kind of caused a wedge. And, and as I sit here, I think, oh, well, if I think of my dad's values, what's underneath all of that, if I can just not let that be what um, gets in the way of me seeing him, then I realize he and I have a lot of the same values. You know, like, he is very concerned about the state of affairs of our country. And he very much values freedom and sort of a libertarian model. And, um, you know, he values honesty, you know, even if it hurts and all of these things. And I'm like, oh, you know, People can share values and go different ways with their behaviors of how they implement them. And so when you mentioned that your mom, you said your mom values church, and I, I would say, well, that's, that's a behavior based off what she actually values, right? She probably values community. And maybe she found a community that accepted her for who she was, and she was able to share that with you. And so you were able to accept yourself the way you were, which is an amazing gift. And so, you know, it's, it will feel threatening to her that the things she gave you that you value, 
you know, you're saying is harmful. And, you know, so just it, it really hit me that this is what has to happen for us to stop killing one another. So I, my, I have five children and four of them are out of the house and are adults now. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about this uh, from the mom's perspective. And um, one, of my, one of my kids um, went off to college and the next day she ended up checking herself into a psychiatric unit. Um, college was just overwhelming for her. And I spent the next, I don't know, six months of my life realizing how... Um, how difficult, how, how many toxic um, things were running in her head, and some of them were from Mormonism, but a lot of them were from me. <laughs> um, and I would never have intended to hurt her, but the last few years have been a, a lot of me unpacking things that I said that unintentionally hurt her. And um, another one of the things that I realized is that one of the most deeply spiritual times in my life now, like, this is my new temple, is sitting with her and hearing her cry and not needing to fix her. Um, Because if I as a parent now with an adult child give her this feeling that I need to fix her, what I'm telling her also is, you are wrong and you need to be fixed. And I, I have felt more and more like that is the thing that I must never, at least do my best, I'm, I'm going to mess up, but that is the thing I want to do my best with her. And so when I was on vacation, she had this massive panic attack in the middle of San Francisco <laughs> and for an hour. She was sobbing. Um, again, something that I did that triggered her. And I sat with her for an hour and said to her over and over and over again, there is no place I would rather be than right here with you. Like, please let go of this idea that you have messed up our vacation or that there was something else I wanted to do. This is the connection that is motherhood. This is the best part of my life. I can't imagine anything better than a child, share, like an adult child that I raised and did my best with coming to me and saying, like, you harmed me. And so we have been working on this process of, this is part of my um, journey about giving up exercise because that's one of the things that damaged her is that I gave her this idea that, that it was her fault that her body is this way, that she, she doesn't have a perfect body. And I have lived my whole life with this compulsion to perfect my body and I didn't realize I was doing that. So that's another thing where I've just been, oh, I have to change. But I just wanted to say, like, from the mom's perspective, I can't imagine anything more beautiful, more spiritual than, like, that is the temple of my life, is sitting with my kids in their pain, reminding them again and again, this is the best part of my life. I love you just the way that you are. You don't need to change a thing about you. This, just sit with, you know, this is who you are. Sharing that with me, that is the best. One of the deaconesses. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. That was beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay. Well, um, this is beautiful. Thank you. Lots of tears. <laughs>